Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm gonna share some of the things I learned as a first time mom and how I'm gonna transfer that knowledge to being a second time mom. All right, so there is obviously a lot that you learn when you become a first time mom. It's like a crash course, honestly, in becoming a mom. You just like are thrown into it and you are learning so much. I don't know why this is the first thing that stands out to me, but I feel like because it happened pretty early on into Nikosh, my toddler being born, it's that he got cradle cap and I had never known about cradle cap. If you don't know what cradle cap is, it's when they get kind of like really thick, almost like dandruff on their scalps and you know, they barely have any hair. Even though Nikosh was actually born with a lot of hair, he got this, it's really scaly and nobody had ever told me about that. I asked all of you guys like on Instagram and stuff, like what do you do for Cradle Cap? It was actually one of the inspirations for me to start the fam group on Facebook was because I realized I was trying to ask a lot of my mommy followers what they did and Cradle Cap was one of the first things that I asked about because I just wasn't expecting it. First off, if your baby does get Cradle Cap, the way that I handled it was a lot of moms were like, use either some kind of a natural oil, like coconut oil, olive oil, any of those, put it on the scalp so that it can really soften the scalp. And I was actually very anti because I was like, you don't put coconut oil onto your skin. But um, I got really desperate because Nikosh was going through really bad cradle cap. You have to get some kind of a shampoo. I ended up using Medela because it has a little bit of salicylic acid in it and that's gonna help really exfoliate the scalp. And you put it onto their hair and onto their scalp while, they're, while you bathe them. And then you take a really soft brush. So there are all these like little baby brushes. The brush that I had was, it was really small silicone bristles on one end and then a sponge on the other end. And what you do is you just lightly massage their scalp. And I did that prob probably about three times on Nikosh and it all went completely away. But I found out from a few doulas that I know that they always recommend to their clients to start using a bristle brush like that, a soft bristle slash sponge brush on the newborns when they, like right away, like as soon as you start bathing your baby, start to brush their scalp with it every single day. And that way you're just gently rubbing all of that away and then your baby just won't get cradle cap. So that's something I've learned and I actually share that with new moms all the time. I always get them one of those cheap little brushes and I'll actually leave a link in the description box for one of these brushes. They're like three, four bucks, something like that. It's really cheap. You can get them on Amazon. Just have them ready to go. You know, gently brush your baby's hair when your baby is new and fresh and you won't have to deal with cradle cap. Another thing I learned was to have diaper rash cream on hand immediately the minute you bring your baby home. I guess in my mind when I became a mom, I was like, oh, you know, diaper rash has happened, but I probably won't need diaper rash cream right away. But it turns out I needed diaper rash cream right away. Um, I ended up using butt paste and I still use that all the time. Their skin is so like new and fresh that they're just so sensitive to everything right away and you don't know which diapers are working for you yet and you know you haven't gotten to that point where you're like testing everything out to see what absorbs the best and stuff. So you need diaper rash cream almost immediately. Like that first week we started using it. Go with like the strongest strength of diaper rash cream because you're just gonna end up needing it anyway. And what I also realized is that you just glob it on. Like the more you put on, the better. And you know, when I first started using it, I would just like, just gently put like a little bit, almost like lotion onto my baby's butt. And then we went to, uh, I wanna say like, it was like, he was maybe two weeks old. We went to the pediatrician's office. She took one look at his, at his butt and she was like, oh, you need diaper rash cream. And she pulled out like this extra strength desitin and she put the entire packet on his butt. Like she just went and just like globbed it onto his butt. And I was like, you use that much? She's like, yeah, you wanna form this really thick barrier to protect the baby's skin from being wet and moist and you know absorbing all of that stuff. And that's how you prevent the diaper rash and let it heal. So I was like, oh, I guess that makes sense. So while I was over here like, oh, just put a little bit, it turns out you just need to like glob it on and, and don't be shy with it. You know, speaking of that appointment with the pediatrician, I think, we, it, again, it was like two weeks into having the baby and we were completely sleep deprived at that point. Like it was starting to feel like torture, like I might never sleep again, which we'll talk about in a little bit. You know, we went to the doctor's office and we're talking about, you know, she's asking us all these questions about how it's going and stuff. And we're just like, he's just not sleeping, you know? And she obviously like broke it down for us. Like, you know, newborns don't sleep. He was under 10 pounds. He was like, six pounds, four ounces when he was born. So the, you know, the doctor broke down why the babies don't sleep. 
it's, you know, there's for safety reasons, first off. Usually the deeper a newborn sleeps, the higher risk they are of SIDS. I don't know if you guys knew that. So that's something that we found out. So you don't want your baby in the very, very beginning to be like in a deep, deep sleep for long periods of time. But second, because they're small, they need to eat. Even if they are sleeping, the doctor was like, you know, no, wake him up every like two to three hours because you need to feed him. So he continues to gain weight. You know, that stuff made a lot of sense to me after she explained it, especially the SIDS thing, like that deep sleep, you really don't want that. Not in the beginning, but she also asked, are you swaddling him? Our first response was, he doesn't like to be swaddled. And my pediatrician just looked at me, she goes, no baby likes to be swaddled until you swaddle them. And she was absolutely right. It was one of those things where when I look back on it, I wish we would have started swaddling right away. We started using the miracle blanket. She was the one that suggested that. It just made swaddling so much easier, which was another reason why we stopped swaddling was because it just wasn't staying the original swaddle that we were using. So once we got the miracle blanket, it was, amazing but what ends up happening is you know you want to make sure that the babies are like this you know they feel like they're safe they're not getting that like twitch that they get when they're newborns and stuff their nervous system is not mature yet so you know sometimes they get twitchy and stuff like that and that wakes them up and it can be jarring to them so they just like to feel really safe and secure when they're swaddled and while they might like cry and be upset when you first put it on them it really does calm them down and it's true babies don't like to be swaddled until you swaddle them that leads me into the next thing and that's baby wearing, which is kind of similar. It doesn't seem like it's similar until you really think about the mechanism of it. I really wish I would have stuck out baby wearing in the beginning because in the beginning I was like, oh, my child doesn't like to be in you know, a sling. He doesn't like to be in a wrap. I don't like to have him in the ergo baby because I feel like he's uncomfortable. What I've learned is that babies are a little bit uncomfortable sometimes. They squirm, they like kind of fight and protest and stuff as they should. They're little baby humans and we fight and protest things too until we sometimes don't know what's best for us, right? It's the same with the babies. They don't, they truly don't know what's best for them. You do as the parent usually. And what I found is um, I was so worried about my baby even just crying or making any kind of noise. They might be uncomfortable and protested at first when you're like getting them into position and stuff. But once they settle in and you've got everything nice and right, they love baby wearing. It starts to become helpful to wear them because then you have your hands free. They don't actually cry as much because they're right there on your chest. It's one of those things that in my first pregnancy, I wish I would have done it more and stuck it out in that first six months. You know, I didn't really get comfortable with using a sling ring or using the Ergo Baby until probably, you know, a little bit later. And I really wish I had done it so much sooner because once I did get comfortable with it, it was a game changer. And I never even really got the whole baby wrap thing down because I just didn't do it when, I, when he was that small. So I really wish I would have done it this time around. You guys are gonna see me baby wearing all the time. I'm gonna really like, be convicted and stick with it and wear my baby. The next thing I learned about the baby is that they don't need to be as warm as you think. So I say this because I don't know why I had this misconception that babies needed to be like completely like covered. You can't let them have like any chill whatsoever. You have to make sure they're in like long sleeves and completely wrapped and covered and just warm and everything warm, heater turned on and all that stuff. I had a baby in the winter, it was February. So for LA, it was even kind of cold. I thought I had to have like the temperature really up. And then again, I talked to the pediatrician about this and she was like, no. You bring that temperature down. If anything, turn the air on. <laughs> She's like 68 degrees to like 72 degrees is more comfortable for them. You know, you don't want them to get sweaty. And again, back to SIDS, you don't want them to get too hot or overheated because that could be bad for them. You want them to be in, a, in the perfect temperature. And so when it even came to like dressing my baby and stuff, the way the pediatrician described it was, wear whatever would be comfortable for you because it's the same for the babies. You don't wanna be overheated, right? Same with the baby. They don't wanna overheat and be sweaty either. Next, this was a really hard lesson for me. Um, so many people had told me, you know, after my baby shower, all that clothing that I get, take all the tags off and wash it, have it ready to go for the baby, have everything all set up and ready to go for the baby with all the like devices you get, whatever it is, have it all ready to go. And I realized that was a big mistake moms, my mom friends and family members. That was a big mistake to have everything ready. Instead, what you should do, so when it comes to like the clothing for instance, just have like 
three or four outfits ready to go in a couple of sizes. Like I thought, you know, the like newborn clothing was gonna be perfect for Nikosh. He was a touch small. We ended up having to get um, clothing that was for preemies, like his first couple of weeks of life. And then he moved into that newborn clothing. And then what I found was all that stuff I had washed that was for sizing that was bigger, you know, like when you get into like the three, the three to six month clothing and then the, you know, clothing that's like six to 12 months and all of that stuff, you kind of don't know what season it's gonna be either when your baby can finally fit into that clothing. So what I learned was it was a big mistake to have it all washed and ready to go and the tags off because half of that stuff didn't get used. You know, and I'd wondered this sometimes, like some of my friends had given me like hand-me-downs and stuff that still had tags on and everything. And I think it's because we all learned with that first baby um, is that you don't, you can't really guess when they're gonna be fitting into a specific size, especially that first year of life because they grow at such different rates. They're like growing really fast and then it slows down and then really fast again. And so it could be summertime when they're finally fitting into like the six month clothing, but you know, everything you have is like winter clothing, like sweaters and long pants and thick stuff, you know, that you washed and had ready to go, but it turns out you should have just returned that stuff. And in fact, if you have clothing that is that far out, I would just return it if you can. I mean, I hate saying that about gifts and stuff, but I would just return it and get credit for it because you're gonna end up needing it later to get the clothing that fits at the moment that you have the baby fitting into those certain sizes. It's something that like didn't even occur to me, you know, that you can't really like guesstimate what, when your baby, what season it's gonna be when your baby's fitting into that stuff. So only have a few outfits ready to go. Don't wash everything, cause you really don't know. And you know, I also learned that like, I didn't end up using a lot of like the really cutesy outfits and stuff in the beginning. I only wanted to use like little zip up onesies on him because I found that he like hated when I was putting stuff over his head and stuff. I ended up getting, you know, like tops on him that were more like you know, that would snap on like this instead of going over his head. So there's so much that you're learning with those first couple of months with the baby too. You don't wanna wash all of that stuff. You might not use it and then it'll go to waste. Same goes with all of the like products that you get for a baby. Sometimes a product can work and be a miracle for somebody else. And they're gonna like swear up and down, like this changed our lives for all of our kids and stuff. You know, this, people said that about like the rock and play and about the swing, the swing thing and about, you know, people are saying that about the snoo and all that, but you really don't know. You don't know if it's gonna work for your baby is what I found out. And so while the rock and play worked for everybody and it's now recalled too, it didn't work for us. Our baby hated it, but he did love the swing. You know, the same thing happened with a lot of other baby products. We ended up sending a lot of stuff back and everything. And so we were really grateful that we had kept the packaging for a lot of these products because we were able to send them back very easily because you realize pretty quickly in, it's like two, three weeks of them not using it. They might end up using it later. There were some products that we had that sat around for a long time until Nikosh suddenly was interested in them, but you really just don't know. And so that's the reason to keep some of the packaging and stuff. Next was a really hard one for me, letting go. What I mean by that is letting your husband figure things out. And I would say spouse, but I, I'll tell you my lesbian friends that, um, that are, you know, that are having babies together and stuff, they don't go through this issue. So I'm pretty certain this is what happens when you are married to a man. <laughs> this is a guy thing, very, very specific. I'm sorry to generalize, but it's absolutely true. You know, it's one of those things like we get so controlling, we're figuring it all out. We finally realize like how to calm our baby, how to feed our baby. We're spending a lot of time with our baby because that's what we do. You know, at the same time, I'm getting frustrated with my husband for not helping out, right? For sleeping through the crying, for not knowing how to feed our child and stuff. And one day my husband pointed out to me that I just gave him anxiety. I was like overwhelming him, you know? I'd hand him the baby and then I'd stand there and like hover and be like, you're not doing this right. Do this, pick the baby up, hold her, like hold him this way, feed him this way, do this, pat him, burp him, blah. And you know, when I think about it, it's like, if somebody treated me like that, I would flip out. But I was doing that to my husband. I was like not letting him figure it out. And so I started realizing he got much better with the baby when I would let him like go be in the nursery by himself, when I would actually leave. Holy moly, it was hard to get me to leave. I don't know why I felt like I had to be there or my baby might not make it. But I did, I felt like that. And I don't know, you know, I think there's a little bit of hormones happening. First time mom, you're just so like insecure and stuff. So there's a lot of that happening too, but you have to take a step back 
and realize that if you don't let your husband just figure it out, yeah, your baby might cry a little bit, your baby might get a little bit hungry, but they need to figure it out together, just like you're figuring it out with your baby. It maybe happens a little quicker with you because you are spending that like quality time, that you know much more dedicated time with your baby. In the beginning, especially if you're breastfeeding, you are doing a lot of the feeding because obviously, but once you really let your husband figure it out, they do figure it out and they do get more confident and they do get better at taking care of the baby. And then guess what? You can be like, here you go, I'm leaving. And you can have that freedom and less anxiety and it just gets so much better after that. Next, let's talk about sleep. You know, sometime in that first month, I remember sleep being torture for me, the lack of sleep and trying to like really figure that out. You know, I wanted to do everything by the book, which obviously do everything very safely. You don't wanna like co-sleep in an unsafe way. You don't want to like let your baby sleep on their stomach without you watching them and all that kind of stuff. There's so much stuff about sleep that can be so scary because that first few months of life, you feel like, you know, you hear so much about SIDS and stuff and suffocation and everything. So you're just so worried when you're a first time mom. And it wasn't until I got more comfortable with like what's working for us that I started to realize like we could get a little bit of sleep, at least a little bit, and life starts to get a little bit easier. But what I learned about sleep in general is that it's off and on. You might not sleep like you used to before you had a kid, but you will sleep again eventually. You'll get some sleep. And then there will be times throughout your kid's childhood that you don't get sleep. We didn't sleep that first month, probably, not really. Uh, we start co-sleeping and then we start getting sleep. But then around like the four month mark, he started squirming in bed. Anytime I moved, it would wake him up and everything. We started not sleeping well again. And then at six months, we sleep trained him. And then we had like probably a good period. That was probably our longest period from about six months to 10 months where we didn't have any sleep regressions whatsoever. And life seemed magical because we were just sleeping. Besides me being a little bit of an anxious person, but I slept pretty well in that period of time because I think I was so sleep deprived before it. So from six months to 10 months, we slept really well because we had sleep trained him. But then, you know, when Nikosh was about 10 months, he got sick. He wasn't sleeping through the night. I ended up going back on the sleep training and letting him sleep in bed with us and holding him to sleep and doing all of that stuff you're not supposed to. And it messed up his sleep training. We didn't sleep well again for a couple of months. He slept with us in the bed for a little while. And then we finally like transferred him back to his room. And so we, I realized you know what, there's just this up and down when it comes to sleep. You're gonna sometimes get sleep and sometimes you're not. And that's just kind of the way it is, you know? But you know, that feeling, that helplessness that you feel when you first have a baby, and when I say helplessness, I, f I, I mean it. Like you feel like it's almost like torture, the lack of sleep, but you will get through this and you have to do whatever you can to get through it. Another thing I learned is that your social life just isn't the same. I don't care who you are, <laughs> or what you do, or how much money you have, or anything, your social life will never be the same. And the sooner you realize that, the better your life gets. And my example of that is, you know, before we had a baby, we would kind of judge, actually. We would judge all our friends and family members that had babies before us, and we'd be like, oh God, this, these people, like we don't see them anymore because of their sleep schedule, or, you know, it's like, you know, we would judge them for not trying to bring their baby to a restaurant with us for dinner and all that stuff. And we kept saying, we're not gonna be those kinds of parents. We're gonna travel with our baby. We're gonna take our baby to dinner and make him a social baby. And we're gonna like let him sleep in his stroller if he wants to, um, instead of like having him home during his nap time and stuff. And even vacations, like we thought we were gonna like just take all these amazing vacations. And it, you know, partially it's because we have seen people that make it look like it's that easy. And so we were like, that's how we're gonna be. We're gonna be those people, the cool parents. And you know what I learned? And it took us a long time, actually. It took us over a year to really learn our lesson. Once we started to really accept that our social lives had changed, and when I say we, I mean me and my husband, it, it was both of us. Then I think our lives got so much easier and they, our lives just improved because all that expectation just went out the door, right? So we start learning that when we stuck to a sleep schedule, our lives were more predictable. It was easier having him at home to sleep in his crib because that's where he slept the best, not in his stroller. He wasn't one of those kids that liked to sleep in a stroller, no matter how hard we tried. Sometimes there were gonna be dinners we said no to because we can't make it to everything. And it wasn't gonna be fun to have our baby at the dinner because he doesn't sleep through that. He doesn't sleep in a stroller. Even vacation. 
when we stop planning so many things and like an itinerary on vacation, you know, our best vacation was actually just in this past November because um, we went to Mexico and we stayed at a resort. And guess what? We just stayed on the resort. We made it about Nikosh. It was all about swimming and activities for him and going to the play, the kids club and doing all of that stuff. And then, you know, it just felt easy. It felt like the best trip we'd ever had. Nikosh had so much fun. We had so much fun because we weren't stressed out about being like, what about our pool time with our cocktail? And, you know, like having friends come with us so that we can all go to dinners at night and stuff. And so when I say your social life changes, it's fine, it's okay. When I started saying no to most things, to being like, no, I can't go on that trip with you. No, I can't go to dinner with you. Actually, I won't make it to brunch. My life just became so much easier and I felt less guilt because I wasn't, you know, like going back on my promises and I wasn't being a flake and not showing up last minute. Instead, I was just like upfront, no, can't do it. And it's just gotten so much better from there. And I guess that leads me to the last thing. And you guys, there's obviously, I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And I'm sure all of you guys have things to add to this too. But the last thing is that there really is no right or wrong way to parent your child. There really isn't. You have to go with what works for you. Like I said, even with like the whole social life thing, you know, we had friends that were amazing. They went on trips all the time. They seemed to have their kids with them at all social functions and stuff. And their kids seemed fine and they were managing it. But then we had the other friends that were like, no, we have to stick to our schedule and stuff. And we quickly realized we were the, we were the people that had to stick to the schedule and be, a, you know, a little less social. And that's what ended up working for us. And also things like, you know, when it comes to whether you're going to swaddle or whether you're not going to swaddle, whether you're gonna baby wear, whether you're gonna let your husband take the reins, whether you're gonna just trust other people, all of that stuff, sleep training. I mean, it really is up to you. You have to do what works for you and your family and everyone's circumstance is different. And you know what? Every baby is completely different. I think that's like the biggest thing. You know, I can even tell this current baby in my tummy, she is going to be so different from Nikosh. Like when I think back on him in my tummy, he would kick my tummy like at very specific times every single day. He's turned out to be a really good sleeper. And those were the times that he's awake and he was actually very predictable and he still is. He's still very much that kid. This little girl on the other hand kicks me at all times. I have like no idea when she's gonna kick me. It's hard to keep track of it and like guess when it is. And so I'm really worried when she comes out if she's gonna be a bad sleeper. So you just don't know what your kid is gonna be like and that's okay. You just gotta do what works for you and you gotta get through it. So those are just some of the things I learned, but probably the most important things, the things that stand out to me the most about being a first time mom. Tell me in the comments below if you agree with me, if you have other things to add, because there's so much more to it. Find me in the FAM Facebook group. I started that for all of us to have a community to talk to and give advice and even just vent sometimes. I'll leave a link below in the description. You can find me on Instagram at Susan Yara, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.